Good morning. Welcome to uh, Grace Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. It's uh, so wonderful to have you here. If you came in and uh, got a bulletin, take it out, please, and uh, look inside. I want to point out a few things to you. And as you're turning there, we want to, uh, to welcome uh, John Grayson Henderson. He's playing the uh, piano for us today. And hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll stay with us for a very long time. His parents are here too. They're sitting right back there in the back. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Thank you all so much for coming today and uh, for sharing, sharing him with us. Um, inside your bulletin here are a few things I'll point out to you. Uh, in a few moments, we will read Psalm 95, so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Psalm 95. That'll be our morning reading this morning, Psalm 95, and uh, we will pray for the Vine Life Fellowship Church. As you know, we pray for um, other churches here in our community every week, and so this week is no different. Uh, we'll pray for the Vine Life Fellowship Church this week. And uh, you can see the uh, songs that we will sing together today as uh, they come and lead us. And uh, today we start our fall study on Sunday mornings. Uh, our fall study will be over the pastoral letters, which are 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So over the next few months, we will explore those three books. So if you want to read those books ahead of me, please do that. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. And then each week we'll come in and uh, explore uh, the next passage in the uh, book. Uh, this Wednesday night, we will not have Wednesday night Bible study. Okay, so this Wednesday night, no Wednesday night Bible study. But the following Wednesday night, Lord willing, we are going to uh, have uh, discussions on Wednesday nights, Bible study, about uh, the pastorals. So the whole fall on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights will be dedicated to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus and exploring what's in there and how it relates to us and applies to us. Okay? So that'll be uh, Wednesday nights. As you can see also, uh, we will participate together at the Lord's Supper table today. Uh, that'll be at the end of our service, and uh, I'll give you some, some directions toward the end of the service. Um, inside your bulletin, I, I want you to, uh, can you pull that out for me? <clears throat> I want you to just shake it at me a little bit so I know you have it. All right, there you go. Like five of you have it. All right. We, uh, <laughs> if you don't have it, get it. Because uh, what I've done here is, um, as I've outlined the sermons, so uh, Lord, this is all Lord willing, of course, but you see every Sunday for the next 15 weeks, this is the passage that we will explore together. So just keep that there inside your Bible, and uh, each week we'll explore the, the next one down. I just thought that would be important for you to have, so you can follow along and also uh, read, read ahead. Uh, our question for this week is uh, a wonderful question, and uh, this question is put in here, and the answer is put in here for you and your family's sake, so I trust that uh, each week you are going over this with your family, with your, uh, with your spouse, and also with your children. We've also given you all the verses here, which represent the answer, so you know that the answer came from the Bible. And the question this week is, how are you righteous before God? Probably the most important question that you'll ever ask is this question. How are you righteous before God? And the answer here is, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice the rest of this question, or the rest of this answer I should say. Even though my conscience accuses me. All right, let's stop right there. Everybody look up here. Does that ever happen to you? Okay, me too. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against God, even though my conscience accuses me of never having kept any of the commandments, even though my conscience accuses me of being inclined toward sin, 
Nevertheless, without any merit, that's work, of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, and as if I had been perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift with a believing heart. Can we all just say amen to that? Amen. What a wonderful question and answer this week. And you've got all the verses there that represent that answer. Well, once again, I want to welcome you to Grace Baptist Church. I'm so thrilled that you're here this morning. Um, in a few moments, I will read Psalm 95. I don't see uh, Hugh here this morning. I think he may still be on vacation. So I'll read Psalm 95. So if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bible to Psalm 95, I'll read that, and then I'll pray. And afterwards, Brad and Lori and Heather, you come. So Psalm 95. Uh, this is God's Word. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. To His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, We are a people who go astray. They are a people who go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Amen and amen. Let's pray together on this Lord's Day. Father, we thank you for this day and the privilege of life and the privilege of new mercies to us this morning. We ask in these moments that we've gathered today in your word, inspire us today to trust you because you are able to save. And we thank you for preserving us and keeping us and for the promise that you will never leave us. Father, we ask that you would turn your special attention and affection to the Vine Life Fellowship Church today. We ask that you would bless them with your presence, that you would give them a conviction of their sin and a pointing to the Savior, your Son, the Lord Jesus. We also ask that you would give them assurance and joy in believing the gospel. Again, we thank you for this day and the blessing of life that you've given each of us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning again, Grace Baptist Church. It's so glad to see each of you here to worship with us this morning. If y'all would all please stand at this time. And as Kevin said, we are going to sing some songs of praise to the Lord. And we will begin this morning uh, with hymn number 139, Let There Be Glory, Honor, and Praise. Let there be glory and honor and praise.
Since Jesus came into my heart, we'll sing three verses this morning. songs of praise this morning with we have heard the joyful sound we'll sing three verses Bear the news to 
I hope that you have a Bible with you today. If you do, take it out, please, and turn with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And uh, as you're turning there to 1 Timothy chapter 1, there are uh, two, two words that I want to lay on your mind this morning that will guide us through these uh, first 20 verses of uh, 1 Timothy. The first word is the word sound, and the second word is the word faithful. Sound and faithful. Let's pray together this morning and ask the Lord to bless the reading of His Word, and then I will read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. Let's pray. Father, incline our hearts to Your testimonies. And away from gain. Call us to that which is eternal. Help us to see the frivolity of that which is temporal. Open our eyes to see and our hearts to receive the truth of your word. Unite our hearts to fear you. And satisfy us with your love. The love that you vividly demonstrated in sending your Son and in sacrificing Him on our behalf. Bless the reading of your Word. Multiply its benefits to us. This is our prayer. And we make it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. This is God's Word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior, and of Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia... Remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who strike their father and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the glorious gospel of our blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. 
And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason. That in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan so that they may not so they may learn not to blaspheme. Amen. And amen. May God bless the reading of his word, and may he add his benefit to it on this Lord's day. In 2009, so 13 years ago, August, a group of men came to me and said, we want to start a church. And I said, you are crazy. And some of those men are here, they could tell you that's how that conversation transpired. They said, no, you don't understand. We want to start a church. And I said, well, what? Do you want to do that for? They had their reasons. And I said, well, the only way that I'll be a part of that is if we explore the Bible together and we see what the Bible says about church. And not only do we see what the Bible says, but as a group, we commit to do what the Bible says about church. And they said, okay, that sounds good. I don't think they actually knew what they were getting into, but those men are still here. Faithful men, godly men, persevering men. So now it's been 13 years since we looked at 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So the elders and I were meeting and they said, I think it's time to revisit the pastorals. And so that's where we are today. We're looking at these three books, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus this fall, and we're re-examining what a church is according to God. These three books, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are the last three books that Paul wrote. Paul wrote 13 books, and some even argue that he wrote the book of Hebrews. But these are the three last books of his life. He's on a death sentence. He's about to die. Up until this point, the church, which started after the resurrection of Jesus, if you remember, had been very fluid. Peter was there. James was there. John was there. And even this man named Paul. This letter, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, these three letters, were written about 30 years after after the resurrection of Jesus. So many of these leaders, Peter, Paul, James, John, etc., were dying off. And Paul knew, I think inspired by God's Spirit, he knew that he needed to lay down a blueprint and framework for how church was to be after he was gone. Because up until that point, he and Peter and the rest had been pillars if you had any kind of questions on what the church should be or do, you could go to these experts and you could ask. But now all the experts are dying. They're gone. So there could be a vacuum of, of ignorance. And so in that framework, Paul writes to Timothy, and we'll see in a few weeks to Titus, and he lays down what the church should be moving forward. 
So what we're going to see here in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus have a lot to do with the church and the God of the church, the faith of the church, the leaders of the church, and the way that the church worships God. What we're going to see today, in these first 20 verses at least, is that those who teach at the church are vitally important and they also could be quite detrimental. Now I know most of us were raised in church. Uh, I was in church nine months before, the, before I was born. Uh, I'm sure some of you were like that. So when I was born and I began to grow up, I was in a church and I just assumed that everything that was going on in that church was right. And that's the way many of our church experiences have been. We grew up a certain way and so we think that certain way is right. And then we come to the Bible and we see that the Bible says something in stark contrast to what we thought was right. And that leaves us with a question. Are we going to embrace what God has said in His Word, which is diametrically opposed to my experiences? Or am I going to embrace my experiences and move forward thinking that church is the way I think it should be? Now, since you're sitting in Grace Baptist Church, I know that it's the latter. I know that you're wide open to what the Bible says about church and about faith and about God and about worship and the rest. So what we're going to see today is that these leaders in this church at Ephesus can make the church or they can break the church. And so that principle is true today that your elders and your pastor can make the church or they can break the church. And it all depends on what they're teaching. So the first thing I want you to see is the word sound. The word sound. Paul lays down a challenge to this man, Timothy. He says, as I urged you when I was in Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. So this church is in Ephesus. We have another book in the Bible called Ephesians. And that letter, the letter of Ephesians, was written to the same group of people. Now, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy were written to the pastor of the Ephesian church. The book of Ephesians was written to the Ephesian people. So what we're doing today is we're eavesdropping on a conversation between Paul and this young minister named Timothy. He says, remain in Ephesus for one reason. Look at verse 3. So that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Notice verse 6. Certain persons have wandered away into vain discussion. Does that describe church life or does that describe church life? Now, at this point, Paul is very diplomatic. Wouldn't you agree? He just says certain persons. He doesn't call names. But if you look at verse 20, it only takes him 20 verses, and he starts calling names. But in verse 3 and verse 6, he says certain persons are in the Ephesian church, and they are actually leading people away from Christ. I can't say that any more loudly or emphatically. Christ. We're not talking about people down at the local brothel leading people away from Christ. We're not talking about people at the job leading others away from Christ. We're talking about people inside the church leading people away from Christ. Let that sink in. Verse 7, desiring to be teachers, but not understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. 
He is directly challenging teachers, preachers, pastors, ministers inside churches who do not know or do not understand the gospel of Jesus. There are those in this particular church who have, verse 4, dedicated themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation about the truth. So these false teachers, and yes, I said that. It's not too sanitized on Sunday to say that, I know. But not everybody with a seminary degree is a true teacher. And not everybody who has the office of pastor is actually saved. Is my microphone on? I'm sorry to be so straightforward and blunt with you, but your life depends on it. That you as a hearer, every week, you're coming in and you're listening to me or whoever stands here. And if you decide to leave Grace Baptist and go to some other church, you're going to sit under someone teaching. You must have discernment. You must know truth from error when you hear it. Because not everyone is telling you the truth. And beloved, this should not shock you or even surprise you. Paul even said this in the first century when he said in 1 Corinthians that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. I've told you before, I'm not the brightest bulb in the pack. But if I was the devil, and some think that I am, If I was the devil, I would want the pulpit. That's the only thing I want. I don't care about your iPhone. I don't care about your computer. I don't care about your texting. I don't care anything about that. If I'm the devil, I want the pulpit. Why? Because you come in here every week and some of you turn your ear off and you don't listen to what I'm saying and I could be telling you not truth. So Paul says... He masquerades as an angel of light. That is, he's got a seminary degree. He looks good. He's got the suit. He's got the tie. He, he may even have a great presentation about him, but he's not telling you the truth. You leave spiritually confused. Personal question. Have you ever left church spiritually confused? Maybe you couldn't describe it, but something on the inside just didn't settle right. Maybe that's the way we should say it. It just doesn't settle right. I'm just kind of agitated on the inside because that didn't make any sense. I didn't follow that guy. What's he talking about? And then that turns into, I don't want to go anymore. Did I describe 75% of you? Yeah, I did. Because I'm one of you. Now notice what he says here. The aim of this charge is love which issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have swerved away from this. They desire to be teachers of the law. So what they're doing then is they're aggravating God's people. You following me? By distracting you from Christ, they're actually aggravating you when they preach. Why? Because they're stirring you up with vain discussions, endless myths, endless genealogies, and my favorite word, speculations. If a man doesn't know the truth, he ought not stand here. There's no need for me to speculate with you. If I come in here, you know me. There's no mealy mouth about me. I'm going to tell you the truth. And the only reason I'm going to tell you the truth is because I know it. So a man who knows the truth tells the truth. There's no sense in speculating. Well, I think this and you think this and this means this and this means that. All that's rubbish. It doesn't matter sitting around a campfire asking everybody what they think it means. What matters is what does it mean. These false teachers decided that they wanted to be teachers of the law. So what they do, they just speculated. Just speculated. I want you to listen very carefully to me. 
If you're taking notes, this is what I would write down. The gift is not the presentation. The gift is not the presentation. The gift that you're looking for in a preacher or an elder, the gift is the ability to concentrate your attention on the content which is Christ. Can that man show me Jesus in the book of Numbers? Can that man show me Jesus in Micah? Can that man explain to me Jesus in Luke? Can that man explain Jesus to me from Romans? Can that man show me in Revelation 19 the Jesus who is coming? That's the gift. The gift is not the presentation. And let me give you an illustration of that. In 2008 and 2012, we elected probably the best public speaker who has ever publicly spoken as president. His name was Barack Obama. I don't care if you like him or you don't like him. That's irrelevant to me. He has to be one of the best public speakers I've ever heard in my entire life. He was as smooth as silk. By some accounts and measurements, in Baptist churches, he'd be a great preacher because he's got great presentation skills. Because he's an orator. He can stand up and hold your attention. That's not the gift. The gift is, can this man start with Christ, bleed Christ, and end with Christ while he's talking? Can He show me Christ from Genesis to Revelation? Can He hold my attention on Christ? Can He draw my attention away from myself to Christ? Can He do that? That's the gift. Notice verse 7. You desire to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. They have no idea. They have to speculate. This, beloved, deflects your attention from Christ and it spiritually aggravates you, which is one of the symptoms that I encounter a lot in talking to people here in our beloved town. I was talking to a gentleman uh, Thursday. He called me. He wanted to have a meeting. We had a meeting. We met here at the church. And he said, how's the church going? And I said, great. Great. And he said, no, seriously. <laughs> Do you think I'm going to lie to you? <laughs> it's going great. He goes, well, how many are coming? I don't know. You don't count? Nope. I have no idea. Well, how many are joining? I don't know. I don't count them. When somebody joins, they join. I don't, I don't count. Well, how do you know that what you're doing is successful. I mean, I, I, doesn't that bother you? I said, no, i tell you why. One reason. Only one reason. In our church, we have peace. We love for everybody to come, but that's not our goal. We're not trying to run thousands of people through the baptistry. We'll baptize you if you're saved. If you're not saved, we're not going to baptize you. Because we don't want to mislead you. Hello? I talked to a, a lady this past week. She said, uh, she said, I think, she was kidding around. She said, I think I may need to be baptized. And I said, oh, really? She goes, yeah, it'll be my third time. I said, I think we're good the first two. I don't think we need to do that again. But when you have gentlemen who's standing in pulpits who, verse 7, they desire to be the teacher. They desire to be the public speaker. They desire to be in charge or desire to be the leader. Why anybody would want to do this is beyond me. I've been trying for 20 years to get away from it. And they don't understand what they are saying or the things about which they make these confident assertions. No wonder the church is in the condition it's in. It's not healthy. It's not sound. No... Excuse me. Notice verses 8 through 11. In 8 through 11 here, Paul says, Now we know that the law is good. Now Paul pulls the curtain back and he shows you exactly what these 
certain people in verses 3 through 6 were not teaching correctly. And that's the law of God. He says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding that the law was laid down not for the just, but for the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, the profane, those who strike their fathers and mothers, murderers, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, whatever else is contrary to the glorious gospel of our blessed God and Savior Jesus Christ. So these certain persons in verse 3 and verse 6 were actually misusing the law of God. Listen very carefully. They were using the Bible to distract from Jesus. Is my microphone on? They were using the Bible to distract you from Jesus. They were misusing the Bible. You see, the Bible has an authorial intention. Okay? When you look at the law of God, for example, the law of God has an intention. The Ten Commandments, by the way. We're all on the same page when we say law of God. It has the same intention. Here's the intention of the law of God. Are you ready? It's going to hurt, I promise. The intention of the law is to show you that you are a sinner. The intention of the law is not for you to look at the law and say, okay, I need to try better. I need to do more. Have you ever wanted something that didn't belong to you? Yes, that's called coveting. That's breaking the Tenth Commandment. Have you ever told a story that wasn't the true story? We call it white lies. But those are as black as sin. Then that means you're a liar. Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you? That means you're a thief. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, He said, if you've looked after someone with lust, you've already committed adultery. That means in your heart you've already committed adultery. So just by those four commandments, we're liars, we're thieves, we're adulterers, and we're covetors. Now how many of you feel good about yourself today? The purpose of the law is not for you to feel good about yourself. The purpose of the law is for you to go, oh no! And when you say, oh no, you look outside of yourself to Jesus who saves. Because He kept the law. Do you see? You didn't keep the law. So the law is a mirror that shows you your insufficiencies. Now how many of you this morning before you came to church looked in the mirror? I'll stand here all day. (laughs) Some of you should have looked more in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, why did you do that? Why did you look in the mirror? You looked to see if there was something wrong. Why? So you could fix it. That's how people treat the law. That's how false teachers treat the law. They show you the law and then go, you need to fix it. So their sermons go something like this. Guilt, shame, be better. Guilt, shame, try harder. Beloved, the mirror is the law. The law is the mirror. And it shows you that you are wrong so that you will forsake trying to do better and you will flee to Christ who will save you. But as you noticed, they're deflecting, using the Bible to deflect. Here's the second word. The second word is the word faithful. Right after this, Paul explains his own life and calling and testimony. After he explains all of the sexually immoral and practice homosexuality and they're liars and perjurers. By the way, for what it's worth... Most, most churches love that little section of Scripture that it points out everybody else's sin. Y'all with me? And they look at that and go, well, I don't do any of that, so I'm pretty good. You haven't looked hard enough if you think you're good. So it's easy then to go, homosexual this, 
adulterer this, liar this. Well, I don't do any of that. Make me a deacon. <laughs> I'm sorry, did that come out? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a good guy. No, you're not. You're a lying thief who needs Christ. All of us are lying thieves who covet and lust in our hearts for things that we don't have, things we want. We dishonor our mother and father. We take God's name in vain by the way we live. We've broken all those Ten Commandments. So the key then is to find a faithful teacher. Someone who will not lessen the sin and the law and the guilt and the shame but someone who actually intensifies it and then on the back end of it says, flee to Christ. Go to Him. Run to Christ. That was the kind of teacher Paul was. Look at what Paul said about himself. He said, I thank God, verse 12, that He has appointed me to the service, verse 13, though I was formally, do you see it? There was a change in the man's life. Being a minister was not a profession for him. I wish y'all. He said, though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed to me with faith and love that in Christ. And then he lays down what I think is one of the clearest pictures in the New Testament. He says, This is a faithful saying and a and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The law shows me I'm a sinner and gets me ready for the Savior who is Jesus. Other preachers in centuries past have said it this way, Mount Sinai, which is where Moses received the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai points me to Mount Calvary so I can be saved. But if you take the Ten Commandments and you strip them of their intention and you speculate on them, you not only distract people from Jesus, you not only stir people up, but you actually keep people from coming to Christ. What a sad testimony of a church that a church keeps people from coming to Christ because of what they teach. This was going on in Ephesus. So Paul explains the grace of God given to him. And he explains how you understand the law and how you understand grace and how those two things work together. But then in verses 18 through 20, he says, This charge I trust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that you may wage the good warfare. If you underline in your Bible, underline that phrase in verse 18, that you may wage the good warfare. By rejecting this, some have shipwrecked their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander. I've handed them over to Satan so they may not learn to blaspheme. Let me, let me, let me put this in terms that we'll all understand. All right, this is what Paul says in verses 18 through 20. You ready? He says, stick to the script. Stick to the script. What's the script? Verse 15. God saves sinners. Stick to the script. Use the law of God for its purpose. Don't vainly speculate on it. Don't go into endless genealogies and conversations at the church that you think are spiritual that are really not. Look at the Scripture in its original authorial intention which points to Jesus. He says to Timothy, stick to the script. Guard the people there by sticking to the script. Guard your own heart by sticking to the script. God saves sinners. And He does this by giving us the law to show our sin and giving us our Savior to save us from it. Stick to the script. Otherwise, you're going to shipwreck your faith like Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, so they may learn not to blaspheme. So the challenge here is laid down for church leaders. Not to speculate, 
Not to lead the church into vain discussions. Not to look at endless genealogies and ponder what if this or what if that or what if this or what if that. The purpose of this young man, Timothy, in this church at Ephesus and my purpose here with you and the elders' purpose here with you is to show you the Scripture in its context which always points to Jesus. The whole book is about Him. Genesis to Revelation. Now what do we deduct from this? Let me suggest a few things. First thing is this. Grace Baptist Church has to be simple and gospel focused. In a world full of distractions, the church needs to be simple and focused. The church doesn't need to complicate your already complicated life. Can I get a witness? How many of you are in complicated occupations already? You go work 40, 60, 80 hours a week already and it's complicated. Then you got Tuesday night stuff because you got children. You got Thursday night stuff because you got children. You got Friday night stuff, Saturday night stuff because you got children. Then you come to the church and there's 78,000 things that the church wants you to volunteer for. Am I lying? No. M dot paves the roads. And Baptists wear them out going to their stuff. <laughs> Be simple. That, that's Grace Baptist Church. If you want to describe us, I, I pray, I pray that when I'm dead and gone, after being here for 50 years, that's my goal, after 50 years of being here, when I'm dead and gone, people will say, that church is about grace. But I pray the second thing they say almost immediately after that is, that's a simple church. Anybody can go. Anybody can enjoy it. Anybody can grow. Anybody can learn. Anybody can be saved. Any, anybody there. They don't add all these expectations and rules. It's just simple. It's gospel. Here's the second thing we take away from this. You should expect your pastor to remind you of the gospel and to clarify the gospel for you every week. You should expect that. When you come in, if I'm here or if I'm not here, whoever's standing here at Grace Baptist Church or any church for that matter, you should expect that man to remind you of the perfect life of Jesus, the perfect death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, the intercession of Jesus, praying for you currently, and the return of Jesus. And by the way, for what it's worth, that's the five points that we believe. We've been called five pointers. I just gave you the five points. You should expect your pastor to do that. What else do you want? Is it biblical? What you're wanting that guy to do and be. Here's the third application. The third application is... Look for men with the gift. Look for men with the gift. The gift is not the presentation. The gift is the ability to concentrate on the content the entire time he's there. The content is Jesus. So in a world full of distractions, we need to be simple and gospel focused. In a world full of distractions, you need to expect to be reminded and clarified every time you're here. And in a world full of distractions, you need to look for men that have the gift to hold your attention on Christ. And here's the last one. You need to believe today that Christ kept the law for you. Not you're expected to keep the law, go forth and be perfect, but a recognition that I'm not perfect because I've looked at the law. And in my imperfection, I look outside of myself to Jesus, who is perfect and who saves me. Amen. And amen. I look forward to our fall together.
In a few moments, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together.